Hi there, uh, my name is Łukasz. I'm going to tell you a short story, uh, a bit personal story about usefulness of digitization and digital libraries. So it's about not a product like just uh, uh, Mark uh, presented, but about some kind of foundation, about collecting inspiration or ready to use materials for uh, that kind of projects. Uh, the story is uh, actually generally about uh, reviving the dead uh, and questioning them. So uh, talking about that, uh, people, uh, by the way, uh, did you know that vampires uh, have Slavic uh, origin? And about 300 years ago, lots of them lived, uh, uh, maybe not lived, uh, existed uh, uh, in uh, Polish villages. Uh, uh, hands up who, who, who knows that, that thing. So. Not bad. Uh, I will talk about it soon. Uh, so uh, let me introduce myself. I'm a technology and media expert, but in fact, I'm medievalist. So uh, that's the reason I think that I was uh, many times asked uh, why the Slavic mythology uh, is almost unknown, uh, totally forgotten, absent, uh, while everybody knows uh, something about Greek or Roman mythology, knows uh, Egyptian gods, uh, maybe this Nordic Scandinavian deities, or even the Hebrew one, but there is only one, so it's easy to, to remember. Uh, so, um, um, you know, uh, uh, I used to be very reluctant to answer this question uh, and uh, to talk this subject because I, I know the answer. And the answer uh, is uh, unfortunately uh, very simple. The Slavic mythology uh, virtually doesn't exist. We haven't such things, uh, I think, uh, uh, as Slavic mythology, Slavic, you know, religion. So, yep, that, that, that's a problem. So when Romans had, uh, you know, the great literary tradition, uh, metamorphosis of Ovid, uh, Egyptians encoded their beliefs uh, on the walls, uh, Scandinavians uh, have a dyke poems, uh, um, we have Torah and, you know, all these holy scripts. Uh, Slavic people left nothing. Literally nothing. Uh, we have only scraps transmitted by uh, Christian mis missionaries who, of course, uh, were not uh, like, they, 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 they didn't think that's so cool thing, this, this slaving religion, of course. Maybe some scraps from uh, Jewish or uh, Muslim uh, traders and uh, it's only a fragment, so we cannot reconstruct anything uh, with that. And uh, it is not even an, um, something coherent and stable. We haven't a system of mythology, as we know from uh, other sources. Uh, so, uh, moreover, the dispersion of uh, Slavic people in med medieval times uh, leads me to to presume that more of them followed uh, maybe Islam or Christianity than some kind of uh, imaginative one through uh, Slavic uh, pagan religion. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, sorry for this ugly painting, uh, nature, uh, especially human nature, abhors a vacuum. And this lack of uh, own mythology made people to create uh, it from a scratch. Uh, it was very important in 19th century uh, when independence uh, movements arose and the idea of pan-Slavism appeared. So this uh, monumental, expressive, and kitschy uh, painting uh, of Alphonse Mucha. Maybe uh, you know uh, this painter, he's famous for his uh, 
bourgeois art nouveau pin-up girls and uh, advertisements. Uh, you know, on the cake boxes or, or, or chocolates, they are uh, still reproduced. Uh, but this is uh, one of um, his painting about a uh, uh, epic of the Slavic people. And uh, here we have um, not, uh, something like uh, what is celebration of Svantovit? Uh, you know, flying Slavic people like elves from uh, fantasy tale, uh, and it is inspired by 19th century scholars actually, uh, who were uh, inspired by Indo-European studies, and they have started reconstruction of uh, the so-called Slavic pantheon. Uh, but till now, this research, this work is more juggling the sources and, uh, you know, divagating uh, some unimportant distant stuff uh, than, you know, making some real breakthrough. Uh, at the same time, uh, some impatient, very impatient uh, scholars uh, simply began creating their own sources. So, um, falsifying medieval manuscripts, counterfeiting archaeological finds, uh, and so on. So, this image of Slavic past and spiritual life um, believe me, it's really doubtful, uh, you know. It's doubtful because uh, Slavic people can't fly, for example. Uh, so, uh, going back to this question about absence of Slavic uh, mythology. Uh, my response is like, uh, yes, it doesn't exist, uh, but uh, it doesn't matter because we have really big set of amazing folk beliefs and folk tales. And what is more, the, uh, I think the most successful European legendary character is directly taken from uh, Slavic folk beliefs. And that is the main goal of uh, Project Upyur, uh, which uh, for me and for my team is to show that Polish folk beliefs and Polish folk demonology uh, are way much better there than, than, than some fake mythology, uh, as we can see here. Um, and um, moreover, uh, they are an infinite source of inspiration for all creatives, uh, video games developers, illustrators, storytellers, writers, and more. So, first of all, uh, as you know already, Slavic people does not look like this elvish-like fantasy being. Uh, they look more like that. Oh, that's a surprise. <laughs> no, no, that's not this image. Oh, so we have it already. Yeah, uh, these guys are from postcards published about uh, 1900 in Poland, uh, and they are like uh, depictions of Polish folk types. So um, I strongly uh, believe that these people uh, could say more about uh, this uh, Slavic spiritual tradition than any, any fake mythology written by uh, the scholars. So, um, how to ask them, how to question them? Uh, they are, of course, or, or already that. Uh, so, I turn to, oh, wait, there, is, there should be one more slide, but, okay. We can do without it. So uh, I turned to classics of Polish ethnology and found a lot of, of support from classics like Oskar Kolberg. He was the guy uh, who collected uh, tons of folk material and he's ever uh, called the folk entitled Lud uh, in, uh, in Polish is uh, about 80 volumes of a complex view of Polish folk culture and folk beliefs, folk stories. And his fellow scholars uh, left 
as uh, another enormous material uh, in books and journals. Uh, but how to deal with uh, this uh, really huge amount of data? Of course, the digital library, the OCR process, uh, the tools like collections, notes, helps us to extract this information uh, and uh, simply the technology uh, is the best way to connect to the past. So, uh, these uh, ethnographers uh, covered almost all lands of former Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, they work, of course, uh, after the partitions of uh, Commonwealth. So, in the consequence, uh, they works describe not only the folk beliefs of Poland, uh, as you can see, the uh, modern nowadays Poland is like a, a small part of it, but also Ukraine, uh, Belarus, Lithuania, uh, many small ethnic groups. So it's really a very important, uh, priceless heritage for not only Polish people, but for whole region. But they are one thing in common. Uh, one character uh, can be find, uh, found uh, in every region. So it is uh, like um, eponymous for this project, Upiur, but also in the eastern part, Upiur, Opil, Upil, uh, in uh, minor Poland, Strzygoń, uh, going north, Strzyga, Wieszczy, sometimes Wypiur, or Wąpiesz, uh, it's actually, of course, a uh, vampire. So, uh, we know that we have a very, uh, very strong vampirical tradition. And uh, on the whole territory, this dreadful belief is uh, always present and confirmed. So, uh, this tradition of pop culture vampires, as we know, um, handsome guys from Twilight Saga, you know, it's, it's really fake and it's really not a development of this uh, idea, you know, through blood uh, interview with uh, and so on. So um, here's the difference, uh, because we know from this ethnographic sources that uh, real Upiur vampire was in fact peasant, red-faced peasant, because he drinks blood, so he became uh, very red, uh, a bit chubby, maybe clumsy, uh, he uh, strangles uh, people, and it's, uh, you know, it's uh, something really different that we know from this uh, new, uh, new interpretation. And he is a, a concept art uh, which shows how the uh, true Upiur original vampire made in Poland or made in uh, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, looks like. Uh, it's much better than, than Twilight character. Uh, so, oh, I, I have the previous version of. Uh, my presentation, unfortunately, so uh, I have some slides uh, here which are, uh, you know, uh, not fitted to my plan, but I, I can work with it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I, I will turn to this, uh, this part. It's about, uh, about the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, during the 18th century, uh, we have uh, something really Really new, new concept about fighting the vampires because we had a vampire fever in this region in Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. So many, uh, many uh, writers uh, tried to find these so called superstitions. So uh, it's a work of a Jesuit priest, uh, Jan Bohomolec. 
who uh, tried to find uh, to fight this uh, superstition like you know bringing um, scientific and theological arguments so um, it's uh, like you know uh, trying to uh, prove that new research of electricity uh, can deny the existence of living that. We know from Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, that it's, uh, it's a tricky way because electricity can, uh, you know, revive the, uh, the corpse. So, um, but it's still very, uh, uh, you know, erudite work uh, and it was, uh, it seemed to be an uh, end of Polish beliefs in upur in Polish vampires, but then, uh, you know, Romanticism came and Upiur, Polish vampire, became the key figure of Polish Romanticism movement, of course, key figure of forefathers, if or Jady of Adam Mickiewicz, uh, you know, Adam Mickiewicz Institute is, um, you know, uh, organizer of this session, so the vampire Upiur is still important for uh, us, I think. So, uh, many fragments of Mickiewicz are inspired by this folk, uh, folk poetry, folk tales. So, uh, okay, it's about uh, next being, because we are wo working not only to uh, collect information about vampires, about opiates, but all so-called uh, Polish demonic beings. So it's another one. Leave, let's leave uh, Upiur and move to, to, to the next. Uh, we know uh, the stories about changelings. Uh, they are popular in the whole Europe. Uh, and when in uh, English, Irish, uh, you know, maybe stolen child by Yeats, uh, and French tradition, uh, they uh, kidnap, they steal children, or even knights. La Belle Dame Sans Merci of uh, John Keats uh, is about kidnapping an adult knight. Um, they are always fairies, very beautiful, very gentle, subtle, while uh, according to description of Kohlberg, uh, this demon is uh, maybe, oh, no, it's more like that, has big breasts, uh, but like a haycock, teeth of a hog, big eyes. So there is a slight difference between them and this Shakespearean furries. And let's go to this. So we know all this painting is a, a nightmare of uh, Fusali. It's about some, something sitting on the breast, pressing breast of sleeping woman, some kind of monster. And we have uh, uh, in Poland a similar being called Zmora, or Mora. And um, it was actually a living human being who tra transforms um, in, in some way into animals or even some objects and strangles sleeping people, presses their breast like a millstone uh, or eventually puts the tongue in their mouths and sucks blood. So uh, it's, you know, some monster sub supernatural being, uh, you know, big cat strangling people, but it's still a human being, not some kind of demon or uh, undead. So uh, time is up, so I'm uh, going to conclusion. Uh, when I work with my team, when we um, explored the digitized books, um, newspapers and other sources, uh, we felt almost like um, some kind of archaeologist uh, digging in the history of imagination, all these beliefs uh, forgotten, discarded, uh, distorted, despite uh, being so old, uh, became something completely new. Uh, reading the sources, the old sources in digital form was like reviving 
uh, they're dead. Even if they're dead are, you know, are some blood-sucking cat monsters. Um, all these, uh, you know, stories told by people of the past, uh, to the people of the past, uh, can feed our heads, uh, can be infinite source of uh, inspiration. So, um, as, you, as you can see here, uh, we started collaboration with uh, illustrators. Uh, we, uh, yesterday, we had workshops for uh, video game developers, and we are going to produce uh, uh, animation with Kajetan Obarski, who is responsible for this fantastic animation of these animals in hybridizer and for this own all animation we can see during the conference. Uh, so, um, you know, it's uh, like working with uh, something like a treasure of, of totally new tales, new because they were forgotten. So, if you need more info, uh, what we have done and what we are going to do next, uh, just catch me here and thanks a lot. <laughs>